Do you ever sit in class and think, what am I going to do with this in real life? Hey, I did that in calculus all the time. Turns out, I do use calculus to help my son with his calculus homework. Discrete math, though, I use every day. There is such a thing as an analog computer, a computer that uses physical phenomenon like electricity or mechanical position or hydraulics in order to pass it through a number of mathematical functions like integrators and derivators and multipliers and so forth in order to come up with an answer. They haven't been used commonly for many decades now. Sometimes in research for things like simulation and so forth, they are still being used, but what we have today is digital computers, right? Ones that store computers that store bits, ones and zeros in these locations, these memory locations, and they make specific, distinct, or discrete steps executing instructions to operate on these bits in memory discrete bits. So what we need is some method of understanding how to operate on numbers discreetly, what the effects are, how we can take advantage of it, and so forth. Um, so what we're going to talk a little bit about today is the importance of discrete math whenever it comes to your applications in computing. Please understand, we use discrete math every day. For example, whenever you drive to school or work, there are probably more than one path to take. There's probably many paths to take. And the decisions you make as to, you know, the speed of this segment versus the complexity of this segment and the number of segments and the total mileage and so forth, they work into your decision as to which route you typically take to work. You may even have some sort of aesthetic need. You know, it's just prettier going this way. You know, sitting down at a table to eat with friends, assigning the chairs to who sits where. That's discrete math. Um, we, we do conditional statements at a traffic signal. You know, you pull up to a traffic signal. You know which way you want to go, so you have discrete choices. But also you have operations like if the light is red, you stop. If the person in front of you is not moving and the light is green, you still stay stopped. There are a number of logical condition statements that we use in our daily life. Heck, we even use uh, discrete math when going upstairs. Think about set theory. I have one set, I have a set of stairs, 12, you know, 10, 12, 14 stairs to climb, and I have a set of feet, a left and right foot, and I have to figure out, well, I don't have to figure it out, but I'm mapping each foot to each step in a particular order, in a particular sequence. What would happen if I were a little confused about that sequence? Well, it might be a little bit dangerous. So we're going to do a little puzzle, a puzzle that I used to enjoy doing when I was younger. And we're going to apply different theories at a really basic level of discrete math to solve this puzzle. What I've got is a long division. Don't run away. Don't turn off the video just yet. It's a simple long division. And instead of the numbers being in their correct positions, what I've got is a mapping, a mapping of the letters to each one of the numbers. So there are 10 letters here. Each one maps to a number. And when we decipher this, when we figure out what each number represents for each one of these letters, we should be able to figure out what this word says. It's going to spell out a word, hopefully. Well, let's talk a little bit about solving this problem. How would we solve this problem if we were trying to use a computer? One way we could do it is we could completely disregard this mathematical operation in the beginning and just simply take the 10 letters and map them to the 10 numbers, then do a substitution in here to see if it mathematically works correctly. Heck, we could even do an intermediate step in there because remember I told you that this is going to be a word. We're going to actually have a real word here. So what I could do is I could simply map the letters to each one of these positions. First check a dictionary to see if it makes a word. And if it does make a word, then do the substitution, substitute each number for each letter and see if mathematically it works out over and over again. Let's say on a computer we do do this. And let's say that that whole process of taking every single one of the letters, mapping it to the different positions, testing to see if it's a word, and then verifying it. Let's say it takes a millisecond, all right? How long would it take for us to do this whole operation? Well, first, let's figure out how many operations we need to do. Whenever I first start assigning letters, there are 10 ways I could assign zero, and then that takes one letter out, and that leaves me nine letters to assign to one, which takes another letter out, 
which leaves me eight letters to assign to two, and so forth. And so what we end up with is a number 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which gives us, and this is factorials, we'll get to, into this in a little while, but it gives us the number of options. So what we've got is this thing called 10 factorial. And whenever you compute 10 factorial, whenever you do that multiplication out, what you get is, what is it, 3 million, 628,800, all right? That's a lot of things to go through. Now, please understand, I'm well aware of the fact that before we get to the last one, we're probably gonna come up with the answer, but let's just assume for the time being that I need to compute each one of those. It takes a millisecond for each one. So if it takes a millisecond for each one, that means it's gonna take us about 3,628 seconds or 3,629 seconds to do this operation. Divide that by 60 you get about, well, 60. And that means that it's gonna take us about an hour for the processor to go through each one of these iterations to check for an answer. There's gotta be an easier way. In fact, let's see if we can't simplify the number, reduce this number, you know, using some principles of discrete math. One of the first things that I'd like to do is say, which uh, letters cannot be zero. This should be an easy way to start out. And what this is, is really something we call proof by contradiction. In other words, I'm gonna prove that something is true by making it so that all the other cases are not true, right? So what cannot be zero? Well, if you look at the beginning of any number, so we've got F, let's see, there's F, B, E, the very first, I'm looking at the very first digit, F, B, F, and well, we'll worry about these in a minute, but F, B, E, at a minimum, those cannot be zero, right? Because they're the starting number. We've assumed that we have removed all deleting, all leading zeros. And then for each one of these values, what, this happen, what happens is we take D and multiply it by F, E, S to get F, C, C, A and then we multiply U times FES to get ECF, and then we multiply T times FES to get BDEE. -E. None of those can be zero either, because if any one of those was zero, each one of these subtrahends would have been zero. So D, U, and T can also not be zero, all right? One other thing that we can take a look at is S right here. Whenever you multiply D times S, if S was zero, then this digit right here would be a zero. And then U times S, uh, times S would also have a zero here. And then T times S would also have a zero. So we know that also S cannot be zero. Now what we have done is made it so that we know this first digit right here, this zero, cannot be any of these seven characters. Leaves us three characters, which means that what we've done is we've actually taken this number and we've lowered it somewhat. We've taken it and actually we've taken it and we've taken 10 out but left three in, which is gonna give us, well, let's say approximately a million solutions to look through. We have significantly reduced the complexity of this problem. Made it from an hour long to 20 minutes long, right? At, at a maximum. There is another way to look at this though. This A, can we prove that A is not zero? Can we add A to this list? Well, the only way that A could be a zero is if we have D times S ending in a zero. All right. Now, if you go through all the mathematical operations or multiplications of one digit times another digit, the only way it can end in zero is if D is a five, or and S is even, or if D is even and S is a five. So we can actually look at something called, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, a Venn diagram. And so whenever you're looking at in this big box, this is all the options, all the possibilities. All right. And then this circle right here may be D or S equals five. And then this circle right here would be D or S even. 
Now, the goal is, and please, if you don't understand this, this is fine, but this is just kind of a, a roadmap to where we're headed. If I can prove that nothing lives in here, in other words, if I can have D or S equal to five, if I can't have D or S equal to five, along with D or S, the other one, being even, if there's nothing that lives in here, then I've proved that A can't be zero. Is that true? Well, can we come up with an example? Well, turns out that there are a lot of cases here where D or S is equal to a five, and then there's a lot of leftover characters here where the other one could be even. So this is not empty. And since it's not empty, we know that it is possible for A to be a zero. So right now, what we're looking at is we can't quite get to where we're looking for. We can't figure out who is a zero by eliminating everything else because there are still some candidates that could be zero, specifically O, A, and C, I think it is, are the ones that could be a zero. So let me erase and make a little bit of room so we can figure out another way to solve this problem. So let's take a look at some integer theory, some number theory. The theory of we kind of know how numbers work, right? Can we use any of our ideas of how numbers work to start assigning values to this pattern down here? Well, let's take a look here at this second, this, this second subtraction right here. One of the things that you may notice is that B minus nothing is equal to zero, right? What does that mean? That means that whenever the subtraction occurred, O was less than E. Remember that, because we're gonna need to worry about that later. O is less than E, which means we needed to borrow something. We needed to pull something from the next highest column. By pulling one out of B, we were left with zero because zero minus zero is equal to, well, nothing, all right? We know that the only option for B, it has to be a one. That's the only way that this would work out. So your understanding of how numbers work, that gives you an idea of how to solve at least one of these characters. So we have figured out that B is equal to one. And in fact, we can just go ahead and put little ones next to each one of these Bs to give you an idea of, all right, we got at least one of the digits solved, right? Now, what this has done is that this has reduced our number of operations, our complexity, down to nine factorial. In other words, nine times eight times, because we've got nine letters left for zero, eight letters left, and so forth. Now, how big is this? Well, this is 36, 362,000, 880. That's a lot less. That's 10 less. We've cut it down from an hour down to six minutes now. So our complexity is significantly lower. Do we have anything else that we can simplify? Well, now that we know a couple of things, we can actually figure out other characters based on the value of B. In fact, if we go to this bottom subtraction right here, we notice that F minus one is equal to, well, it goes away, right? So this, uh, this idea that, that and, and we also, we realize that since F and B can't be equal, a borrow must have occurred in order to make F equal to B. So in order for F to equal B after pulling one out of it, then what is it? F minus one has to equal B. So since we know B is equal to one, then we know that F must equal two. And we have our next letter. F is equal to two. So we put our twos in here. There's lots of them. Let's see, did I get all of them? There we go. All right. Now we're down to eight factorial, which is equal to 40,320, I think. All right. Getting a lot easier, isn't it? Now let's continue this thought process, this ability to apply number theory, to see if we can't solve any more of these. Just the characteristics of a subtraction, okay? Now if we look at this column right here, this also looks like we have some prom there's some promise here. If I have O and I subtract D, I get nothing, right? Well, how is that going to work? 
there's a couple of ways it can work. First of all, we already know that whatever this operation is, we borrowed one from the F. So what you're looking at is 10 plus O, and I'm going to put a little crossover here for my zeros to distinguish it, distinguish it from the O, 10 plus O, so you do the borrow into the O, minus D is equal to zero. All right, that's one option. What, it may, what does this option rely on? Well, this option relies on the fact that there was no borrow from this column by the B in the, in the, in the column to the right. If, however, there is a borrow, uh, B requiring something in order to uh, do its subtraction, that would mean it would be 10 from the F minus 1 due to the borrow from B plus O minus D is equal to 0. Now, which ones of these are options? Well, let's do a little bit of uh, uh, a little solution here. Uh, let's start with this top one. 10 plus O is equal to D. Is that possible? All I did was I moved the D over to the other side of the equal sign. Is this possible? Well, I don't think it is, because the only way it can be possible is if O is small enough so that 10 added to it is D, but D has to be 9 or less. There's no way to do that. If, if O is 0, then D is 10. That's the lowest it can be. If O is 1, D is 11. That's going the wrong direction. So we know that this is not an option. So it's got to be this guy right here. So 9 plus O minus D is equal to 0. Solving that, we get uh, 9 plus O is equal to D. Can this be done? Is there any way with the letters that we've got left that this can be done? Well, the only way, let's try zero. So if O is zero, then that means D is nine. If O is one, that means D is 10. We're going in the wrong direction. So guess what? That means that O must equal zero. Convenient that they're shaped the same, uh, the, that they're the same shape, huh? And D is nine. So we've got O and D. All right. And that leaves us how many characters? Well, with the four characters that we've got, we are now down to six factorial, which is equal to 720, even smaller. All right, now, by the way, there are some other observations which we really kind of just uh, uh, hinted at. Um, for example, we know that from our operation here that there had to be a borrow from O to B, which means that B has to be less than E. So we have B is less than E. We also see up here in this subtraction that since no borrow had to occur when we subtracted FAAB, uh, when we subtracted FCCA from FAAB, since there was no borrow required here, we also know that A is greater than C. Uh, let's see, there's a couple others here. Uh, we do know, for example, look at, at this. D times FES gives us a four-digit value, whereas U times FES gives us only a three-digit value. So we know that D must be greater than U because it generated a greater product. Same is true for T. T times FES gave us a four-digit number, whereas U times FES only gave us a three-digit number. The product of T being a larger value also means that T is greater greater than you. We can use tricks like this in order to order things, in order to figure out the order. We're not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to show you that this is this additional observation makes it so that we can, whenever we start getting closer and closer, we can see, oh, well, this, this one has to come before this one, so that actually will give us the ability to sort back and forth. All right, let's figure out E. If we look at this bottom subtraction where we've got B minus E, and by the way, I probably should just go ahead and do my little insertions here of the values. So we know that O is equal to zero. I don't see any others. And that D is equal to nine. So I've got nine, nine. I probably missed one somewhere. All right. Now, 
So we already automatically, two zero minus one nine, we know there needed to be a borrow. So what we've got is, is 11 or 10 minus E equals two. So we know that 11 minus E equals two or 10 minus E is equal to two. How do we distinguish between these two? Well, that depended on whether or not you needed to borrow from the previous column. So let's go ahead and solve for E for this guy. If I solve for E for this guy, what I get is for the top expression, I get that E is equal to 11 minus two, which equals nine. The problem is, is nine is already taken. We, can't, we have a one-to-one -one mapping here, a one-to-one -one relation here. So since nine is already taken, we know that this can't be the case. But this case, let's see what happens. If we solve for E in this one, move E over here and then subtract two, we get E is equal to 10 minus two, which is equal to eight. Guess what? That only other option, there's a spot for it. So we know that E must be eight, all right? Well, that brings us down to just five options, which means we're down to 120. This is gonna be really quick. In fact, we're getting to the point where we might even be able to do this by hand. No, maybe not. <laughs> All right, so we know that E is equal to 8. All right. Next, let's see if we can figure out U. Because we've got, for example, uh, from the second subtraction, we've got U minus 2 is equal to 1. So u minus two is equal to one. How do we know that, that we didn't need a borrow? Well, the reason we know that we don't need a borrow is that the only way that we would need a, could have a borrow when we subtract f from u is if u is smaller than f. The only values smaller than two are zero and one. Those have already been assigned to o and b. So we know for a fact that this operation must be the one that, saw, that, that uh, gives us a value for u. Solve this for u, we get u is equal to three. So we got u as a three. So let's go ahead and assign these values. We're coming really close. In fact, look at this down here. We've got this full subtraction done with determining just C. So let's go ahead and figure out C. By doing the subtraction, you've got 2013 minus 1988. We do that subtraction, we get uh, eight pulled out of three. Well, we need a borrow, right? So that's five, zero minus eight. Well, goodness, we need to do all these borrows, right? All right, so we've got two and then nine. Well, wow, that looks like it worked out right, which gives us five assigned to C. How close are we now? Well, goodness, we've only got three digits left, three characters left. So I have dropped down and I guess I haven't been keeping track here. Three factorial, that's three times two. That's just six options. We're really close. What about other options? Well, let's figure out what S is. And the way we can figure out S, and let's see, I've got most everything here. What I can see is that three times FES is equal to 852. Well, what if I divide 852 by three if I take, because I know three times FES is equal to 852, if I divide three into 852, that should give me what this value for FES is. So three into eight, that's two with a two there, which means we've got eight. Did that work out right? There's an eight, two and eight, we've got that right. And that leaves a one here. So three divided into two, that gives us four. Guess what? I believe that S is equal to four which leaves us just the two letters left, which can be assigned to A and T. Well, two factorial, that's two. There are just two options, two ways of doing this. So what we've got is either A and T or T and A. Now, obviously you can see what it's going to be, but let's go ahead and figure this out uh, mathematically, uh, you know, just for the heck. 
look at this top this uh, this top value right here uh, and I haven't been doing all of my numbers here quite right um, and what we've got is so 1 minus a is equal to 5 there you go 1 minus a is equal to 5 which means that we had to have a borrow since a can't be 0 so that means 11 minus a is equal to 5 so we have 11 minus a is equal to 5 and that gives us a is equal to 6 and by eliminating all other possible options we know that t must be 7 hmm <laughs> obfuscated well that's kind of disappointing Anyway, what we have generated here is, believe it or not, something called a relation, yet another idea or concept in discrete math. I have a relation of a set, the single decimal digits, 0 through 9, to a subset of the, uh, of the English alphabet. So this pairing right here gives us something called a relation. In fact, this particular relation is a one-to-one -one relation. And one-to-one -one relations, whenever you move into a, a topic such as database, you'll see how important that can be. So you think it took some time to solve this problem. Well, it would take even longer to list all the benefits or all the reasons why discrete math is important to you as a computing professional. For example, we use discrete math to get us better at developing algorithms, to apply structures for our algorithms such as recursion, to prove that our algorithms work. I mean, heck, you can come up with some sort of an algorithm that looks like it worked, but there may be those couple of inst instances where this algorithm falls apart, where it fails. So being able to prove that our algorithms work. This is all important. Hey, we also showed we could get a significant improvement in performance, how quickly we can solve a problem just by applying these theories of these theories of discrete math. We can do things like use tools such as trees or, or graphs in order to come up with the answers in order to do things like, you know, in order to figure out that quickest route from home to school, we can do things like using a, a weighted graph and so forth. Um, you know, applying logic to conditional statements. All of those things are conditional operations. All of those things are really going to make us better programmers. So a study of discrete math is not a waste of time.